Thank you. Uh, hello, thank you for coming to this talk. It's uh, quite a pleasure to be here because Campus Party is really cool. I saw a few of the videos online from previous versions. Um, yes, yeah, so I work at Cullum Centre for Fusion Energy. Uh, and I've got to say, I'm not actually a physicist. That's the disclaimer. So if you're expecting high-level physics, you won't find it, I'm afraid. This is just more of an overview. I'm actually a software developer instead. Uh, and I won't write some real-time control software and operational support software. Uh, so what I'm going to talk about briefly is how we get to the point of producing fusion from where we are now, which is an experimental stage, and then hopefully implementing it in a, in a form of power station in the future. Um, I'm going to have a look at the reasons why we need to do this, and then how we actually do it after that. So. Why do we need it to begin with? Well, there's two main reasons, really. Um, this is the first one. We have uh, a constantly growing population at the moment. Uh, this is based on some UN data. Um, if we have a continuing sort of medium level of fertility, then it's quite likely that by about 2040, we're going to have about 9 billion people on Earth. And because of this, we're using more and more energy, especially as more people are living longer because of the um, advances in medical care, and also the fact that more people are uh, having higher quality of lives, and the basic unit of currency, in effect, for a higher quality of life is energy. Um, so as more people in currently less developed countries and developing countries start to uh, live higher quality of lives, higher lives, better quality of lives, um, they will be demanding more and more energy over time. So, in other words, we're going to need uh, to boost our power production quite considerably over the next 100, 200 years or so. Uh, this is a possible graph of uh, energy projections up to the same date, 2040. So you can see it increases from uh, about 13 a uh, billion tons of oil equivalent, the energy that you can get from a billion tons of oil, uh, by about 55% more than what we're currently using, um, to just over 20 billion tons of oil. <coughs> uh, so that's another 55% increase or so. Um, but we need to plug that gap that we're going to have. If people keep demanding more and more energy, we've got to somehow supply it. Um, we could do that with fossil fuels, of course, uh, which, as most people know, it's not a good idea to do because of all the carbon emissions that you generate. We also have the poss possible problem of then damaging our climate and our habitat specifically. And the problem with that, of course, is that then you inter um, cause problems with wet weather patterns, and then you have problems growing crops. And if you've got more people to feed, you're going to have a very big problem then of higher levels of mortality, effectively. Uh, so, um, they're also limited, these fossil fuels, which means once we run out, there's no more of them because we're using them at a much higher rate than the Earth is currently producing them, which is a big problem. <coughs> the, the alternatives are renewable sources of energy at the moment, uh, and there's a lot of good research going on to photovoltaic solar cells, uh, wind energy, hydroelectricity efficiency, because hydroelectricity is already quite a good generator. Um, and concentrated solar power, which uses molten salts um, with mirrors, effectively, to store the energy as heat. You can then extract it over time, if you want, rather than all at once when the light is actually hitting a solar panel. Uh, again, there's a problem uh, with storage of energy, um, which leads on from that. Uh, it would be good to see more and more research being done into how we can store energy for a longer period of time. So, for instance, as hydrogen, uh, we could then use it in a power station just by burning the hydrogen, in, in theory. Um, and even though our electronics are getting more efficient as well, we do have the problem that they're not getting more efficient at a rate which can compensate for the increase in this demand of energy. So, this is just a a very brief glimpse um, of 20 years' worth of difference between our previous energy, and energy generation in 1990 uh, and a doubling of it in 2010. 
So you can see we used tw almost 21 and a half terawatt hours of energy in 2010 globally. Uh, the bad thing about this is that the coal use is, uh, has actually increased and our overall fossil fuel usage has increased by about 3%. Oil has gone down in proportion to how much we're using or generating, but uh, because it's only halved, that means that it's basically stayed at the same level of generation throughout those 20 years. Uh, one interesting thing about that that I thought was, well, I thought it was interesting, is that uh, the alternatives are only accounting for about 1.5%, which is 173 terawatt hours in 1990. But it does look like there's a fair increase uh, in 2010, but it's only just over 3.6%, 3.7% in total. Um, the alternatives include all renewables as well as non-renewables as well, which is the bad thing. So what sort of options do we have um, to try not to produce too much carbon and use up all of the fossil fuels immediately? Well, uh, there's just a few of them. There are others that I haven't put on here. Uh, things like tidal and wave generation, for instance. So solar there means solar photovoltaics. Um, these average power densities are more, um, they're more ideal conditions uh, for the UK. So you can see that solar's got a fairly good power density uh, in principle um, compared to the others. But the prob there is a couple of problems with these. Solar uh, has the problem of distribution in terms of both the light hitting the surface of the Earth. There is enough of it to power all of our energy demand throughout uh, the year. There's f orders of magnitude more of it. Um, but some areas like the UK, for instance, only get a certain amount of sunshine per year. So it's not ideal for us. And then if we were to use concentrated solar, such as the molten salt systems that I mentioned, uh, that would mitigate it, but only to a certain extent. The amount of solar um, fields that you'd have to put up uh, would be far more than we are currently capable of doing, just in, in this country at least. So that's not ideal. Uh, wind is um, obviously being uh, heavily invested in at the moment. Um, but it has a much lower power density, unfortunately. So you have to use a huge amount of land, or alternatively, you can have it offshore. You can have it deep offshore, uh, where the energy density is a bit higher, but it's only about three, meg uh, three watts per meter squared. So it's, it's not huge density. Uh, the <coughs> excuse me. The, the problem with uh, wind at the moment, offshore wind anyway, is that it costs significantly more just because of the logistics involved in transporting and building a huge t set of turbines out to sea. Geothermal is quite interesting. Um, in principle, there's about 50 milliwatts per square meter coming from the Earth's core uh, for all of the land on Earth. And that's not a, not a huge amount. But at certain hot spots around the Earth, you can tap into slightly more of that. Unfortunately, in Britain, it would probably only be about this 17 milliwatts per square meter if you had a very, very ideal power generation system in a geothermal plant. So that probably will be used more in future, but not a, it won't be able to supply enough energy uh, for a big proportion of our energy demand. Hydroelectric is quite good. Um, there's obviously, as you saw from the previous slide, there's a lot of hydroelectricity generation already. Uh, and it's quite likely that that will continue to increase over time because we know how it works and we know how to build it relatively cheaply. Uh, the problem with hydroelectricity is that when you build these huge dams, you do potentially damage uh, some habitats for different creatures that live around those areas. <coughs> so alternatively, we could have nuclear options um, to supply a base load of energy because the renewables are not necessarily a continuous uh, source of energy, or they may be dependent on location. So there's two different kinds of nuclear power. Fission, which is the current uh, form of nuclear power that we have, is when you split atoms apart and get the energy uh, that way. There's downsides to nuclear, though, um, obviously, other than the waste. You have the problem of the fact that even though we have a... Um, 
a reasonable, uh, sorry, no we don't. We have very few years left in terms of um, uranium mines. Uh, if we carried on mining, it would only have tens of years left uh, at current consumption rates. So what we need to do ideally would be to invest in some kind of uh, much safer um, and more commercially viable breeder technology if we were to continue to use nuclear fission, which could extend the fuel amount available to us to several hundreds of years, possibly thousands. Uh, but it still wouldn't be that long, and ultimately. Uh, there are other problems, obviously, like the pollutants that you get. So the, hazardous wa uh, the waste is hazardous for hundreds of years, generally with fission, um, possibly thousands, depending on the kinds of waste. There's different amounts of waste of different types as well. Uh, so it makes storing it over that period of time quite difficult. <coughs> and, of course, there's the operating risks in terms of uh, you get the public fear of meltdown, even though the... The actual chances of that are fairly slim um, compared to coal ash, for instance, which actually provides a higher collective dose of radiation to the public per year than nuclear fission does. Um, but you still have that discomfort. So what we at Cullum are trying to do is researching the method of nuclear fusion instead, which is where you bring the atoms together, and that generates energy. The good things about this are that there are literally millions of years worth of fuel available to us. There's two different fuel types that we'd use, at least initially. We'd be using uh, two isotopes of hydrogen, two kinds of hydrogen, called deuterium and tritium. And that re the reaction of pushing them together um, would generate more than enough e electricity. For instance, the mobile phone batteries in most smartphones now, if you combine that with a, a full s um, tub of seawater, a uh, bathtub of seawater, then that would provide the energy equivalent of burning 70 tons of coal. The, the tritium itself uh, that we'd use is not a particularly common element, unfortunately, because it has a radioactive half-life of 12.3 years. Uh, the most common place you'll find it on Earth is in the upper atmosphere where cosmic rays collide with nitrogen and create it. Um, so what we'd need to do is generate it from lithium, which we can do, and we know that there's a lot of lithium available in seawater. So we could extract it from seawater, and then because of the way the power plant would run in future, we could actually generate more of the tritium from the power plant itself, so it would be a self-sustaining fuel cycle. And we estimate there's about 30 million years worth of lithium on Earth at the moment. Deuterium is about uh, one in every six and a half thousand atoms of hydrogen in seawater, so there's more than enough of that available to us, because there's um, something like, I think it's about 320 billion billion um, gallons of water available on Earth in the sea. Um, in terms of waste, compared to fission, there's very little. Uh, ultimately, the only byproduct of a fusion reaction that we'd be generated, doing on Earth would be uh, helium, which is a greenhouse gas, but it would all be contained. So that wouldn't be released into the atmosphere. There's no carbon emissions from it apart from building the plant itself. Um, the reactor would become irradiated because of the result of the fusion reactions, which means that it would be radioactive and hazardous for about 100 years or less. We can probably make it less if we pick the materials very carefully. Um, so there's a lot of research going on into different kinds of materials that we potentially use in future power stations. In terms of operating risks, there is almost none at all. Um, it can't melt down, it's just not possible because it's very difficult to actually get things to fuse. Whereas with fission, you're trying to continuously stop it from breaking apart instead and stopping the atoms from splitting up. So by making it difficult to actually generate the power, we both give ourselves the challenge of actually getting to the point of commercial fusion, which is annoying, but at the same time, you have this clean and relatively risk-free, well, almost entirely risk-free form of power. So, now you know what we're trying to do. What is fusion, just in case anyone uh, isn't aware. Um, if you have two, you take two light nuclei, um, and naturally, if they are flying about, they will repel each other if they're not going particularly fast because of something called the electrostatic force. They'll come close to each other and then just bounce away. Um, but if you get them close enough to each other, then they stick together because of the very aptly named strong force, strong nuclear force. 
And when that happens, a tiny amount of the mass is converted into pure energy. Um, and that's done through probably the most famous equation in the world, which is E equals MC squared. And because C squared is such a massive number, it's nine with 16 zeros after it, you get a huge amount of energy for just a very, a very small amount of mass. <coughs> so to achieve a net energy output compared to the energy that we're using to actually create these fusion reactions, what we need to meet is something called the Lawson criterion, which is put forward as a, a set of different factors by John Lawson in the mid-1950s. And they relate to the density of the, the material that you're using. So the material itself would actually be a plasma, which is where all of the atoms have been stripped of their electrons. And it would be like a, a soup of matter. And they're completely disassociated, moving of their own accord. Um, and what you'd need to do is make sure the density of this plasma was high enough so that they could uh, so that it would increase the chance of a collision between two given nuclei. Uh, the second one is temperature. Uh, that needs to be high enough to be able to um, increase the velocity of the nuclei so that they, the electrostatic force doesn't actually have a chance to repel them before the strong force can take over and fuse them. And the final one is called confinement time, which is a little bit more subtle. It's basically a measure of how well the plasma is insulated from the rest of the universe. So in other words, how long are you containing the certain parts of the heat within the plasma uh, inside it without it being released into the surrounding environment? And you need to have this reasonably high um, to make, well, I say reasonably high, uh, to, uh, to a certain level um, to make sure that you don't lose too much energy and you're just wasting it effectively. Um, so all of these Lawson uh, criterion factors are also known as the fusion triple product and they vary depending on what kind of fusion reaction you want and where it is. So for instance uh, the Sun is our closest continuously operating fusion reaction and reactor. Um, it's a huge thing, 1.4 million kilometers across, massive, um, and it can meet the density requirement for the Lawson criterion just because there is so much stuff there and it's crushing everything in the middle of the sun to a huge pressure. The temperature of the core of the sun is estimated to be, be something like 250 billion times atmospheric pressure that we're under now, so it's fairly high. Um, the temperature in the core of the sun, um, because it's so big, it can actually afford to be lower than what the temperature is that we want to use on Earth. Um, it's about 14 million degrees in the center of the sun, and it gets colder the further out you get. Um, and the surface is about 5,000 degrees, I think. And the confinement time, because the sun is so huge again, it's able to retain a huge amount of heat. And even at the surface, uh, it's surrounded by a vacuum, near enough. So not that much of it radiates away in space, apart from when you get huge coronal mass ejections. But even then, because there's so much heat around, surrounding the core, you get a, a very large confinement time. One of the... Uh, quite amazing things about it is that it actually fuses 620 odd million tons of hydrogen every single second. And to put that in context, that's about one and a half times the mass of every human currently alive, which is quite a big number. So back on Earth, this is the kind of reaction we want to do. I mentioned that we'd have to use deuterium and tritium. Um, the reason is because this kind of uh, fusion reaction is probably going to be the easiest for us to do on Earth to begin with to get a net energy gain. And what would happen is the deuterium and tritium are heated to very high temperatures, about 200 million degrees. Um, they slam into each other, fuse, create helium-5 for an incredibly short amount of time. And that then decays into both a helium uh, nucleus, uh, also known as an alpha particle, and a spare neutron. And the neutron carries most of the energy. It's about 80% of the energy. And that's where we generate the heat um, by surrounding the reactor with the, uh, what's called the lithium blanket, which would also generate the tritium for the fuel cycle. Uh, and all that heat would be taken away via water, turned into steam, basically, and using 19th century technology from 21st century technology. Um, the temperatures we'd need to get to on Earth are about, like I said, 200 million degrees C, um, so significantly hotter than the core of the sun. 
but that's because we aren't able to produce the same kind of densities on Earth as we can in the sun because we haven't got a lab the size of a star. Um, so we can't really increase that too much. The confinement time is the same. We'd have to have a confinement time for the kind of fusion we're doing at Cullum of around uh, 3.7 seconds, I think. Um, so again, it, w it wouldn't be a huge number. Uh, it would be significantly less than that in the sun. <coughs> But that should be enough to produce enough energy out uh, to make this a viable reaction. So there's two. So well, I'll talk about two of the primary ways in which we're researching uh, fusion. Uh, we at Cullum don't do this method, which is called inertial confinement. Um, this is a, basically where you have a, a tiny pellet of the deuterium and tritium fuel mix, just surrounded by some sort of casing, and you fire a lot of lasers at it the outside surface of the pellet turns into a plasma because it boils away, basically. It's called ablation. And then when it turns into a plasma, as it tries to escape, uh, because it's so hot and get away from the rest of the material around it, it creates a huge pressure on the inside of the sort of shell of plasma. Um, and that would, in principle, compress the very core, the deuterium and tritium fuel mixture, to something like 100 to 200,000 times its standard um, temperature and pressure um, size. And that would initiate what's called a fusion burn and a set of fusion reactions. Uh, there's this facility in America called the uh, National Ignition Facility, and they have 192 lasers. And in total, when they fire that, they get about 500 terawatts of power for about 20 nanoseconds focused on this really tiny pellet. Uh, it's basically like having a micro bomb. Um, but uh, in a fusion power station in future, using inertial confinement, you'd need to uh, blast these tiny pellets about 10 times per second. Uh, at the moment, they're currently doing about two per day at the best. Um, so there's still some engineering challenges that remain there and control system challenges. So the other way, that, and the way that we at Cullum uh, research fusion is through magnetic confinement, which is basically just taking a plasma and putting it inside a magnetic bottle. Um, in Oxfordshire, here in the UK, we actually have the world's largest, what's called the tokamak, which is the device on the left there, uh, which is one kind of magnetic confinement device. And the other kind of magnetic confinement device is that crazy looking stellarator on the right. And they're building one of these in Germany right now called the Wendelstein 7X. The, the word tokamak actually comes from a Russians uh, who invent, uh, suggested it in uh, 1951, and it's the Russian, uh, the English transliteration of the acronym for um, to, uh, toroidal chamber and magnetic field, I think, or it might be the other way around, toroidal field and magnetic chamber. Um, anyway, we have the largest one. So just for comparison, you can see that there's a, a man standing next to it in the bottom left. Uh, so you can see it's quite a big machine. Um, the, the vessel itself is about four meters high and two and a half meters across in the D shape that you can see in the middle. Uh, so it's, as you can see, it's quite big. That means there's about 100 cubic meters of plasma volume that we have in this machine. It is purely an experiment as well, I should stress. So tokamak, uh, because that's what we have at Cullum, we don't have a stellarator. Um, so that's what I'll talk about. It is made up of these really basic components, well, ultimately basic components. Uh, two sets of magnets called poloidal and toroidal uh, field magnets. And in conjunction, they create a magnetic field that is in the shape of a helix and spins all the way around the torus, which is the, the name of that ring donut shape. And that's where you'd have the plasma. <coughs> so the plasma ions and electrons would follow the magnetic field lines created by this helix. The bit in the middle um, actually generates the plasma for us to begin with. We initially pump in some gas, and the, the column in the middle, the sol central solenoid as it's known, uh, has its current reversed in a very, very quick period of time. And this uh, turns all of the gas inside the machine into a plasma because you put a huge voltage across it, and it strips away all of the electrons. And that's called ohmic heating. And that gets the temperature up to about 30 million degrees, which is quite warm. But as we know, it's not warm enough to meet the Lawson criterion that we need for um, some practical Earth-based star making. So uh, we have different heating systems on JET. And future uh, fusion power stations will probably have very similar heating systems to this. 
We have what's called a neutral beam system, which can provide about 26 megawatts of energy. Um, this is exactly what it sounds like. It's a beam of neutral things. The neutral things being the fuel, it'd be deuterium. Uh, and this accelerates ions of deuterium to begin with. Um, through an accelerator, they hit a neutralizer, and then the ones that have been neutralized pass through into the machine at a speed of about 1% of the speed of light, so about 3,000 kilometers per second. <coughs> Quite fast. Theoretically, you can get about 35 megawatts out of this system, but for practical reasons, we've only ever got to about 26. Uh, another form of heating is radio frequency heating. So that puts in about a total of 8 megawatts uh, in total. And that just uh, transfers its energy to the ions from two, uh, yeah, two or three antenna inside uh, the Joint European Taurus, our device. Uh, finally, we have microwave heating, which is exactly like microwaves in uh, your home kitchen, uh, but on a slightly larger scale. And this puts, can put in about three megawatts. It's usually used for a bit less than this now. Um, and it, it used to be used a long time ago, about seven megawatts. Um, we also have real-time control of the position of the antenna for this microwave system. So it can actually move according to where the plasma edge is. So you can get very high efficiency of transferring between the antenna and the plasma. Um, all that energy goes into the mass, same sort of mass as a postage stamp of fuel at any one time in our machine. Um, and that's quite a bit of energy considering it's all about 200 million degrees. If you try to burn a, a standard post stamp to 200 million degrees, you'd soon see it disappear. Um, so what, what do we need to know about that? <clears throat> well, we have various different control systems and diagnostic systems to understand what's going on inside the machine at any one time. And what these do is measure various properties of the plasma, like its density and its temperature. And then we can use that information to control where the plasma is um, and ideally to try and squash it together more if, if possible, and also protect the machine, which is one of the primary reasons for having diagnostic systems, other than experimental data, of course. Uh, the experimental systems, we can use these just to refine the physics models, basically, and also work out how different materials interact with the plasma. Um, the charts just to show that the amount of data we've collected is according to Moore's law. The, the pulse number basically equates to time anyway. So it's an exponential increase in time. The big peak in the last uh, couple of thousand pulses that we've had, a pulse is one set of plasma on jet, um, has mainly been due to an increase in the use of video technology, where we're storing a lot of different data from different cameras. Um, and we're actually using this camera data to um, control the machine. So I worked on a project where we have a, a camera looking at the microwave antenna and we use it to detect when there's a big arc, uh, like a lightning bolt, uh, generating on that antenna. Um, and we use it to prevent that from happening in real time now. So we don't really generate that much data in total. It's only about 45 gigabytes per pulse, uh, which is 80 seconds long or something. Um, but what we're doing with that data is actually quite interesting in that it's, a lot of it is real time control. There's also obviously all of the data that we have uh, afterwards when various different uh, measurements are processed by the physicists in the different analysis codes. Um, so that's the inside of the machine that we have in Cullum. Uh, and I think I first saw this when I was about seven because that's when we first used deuterium and tritium. I say we, I wasn't working there at that point. Um, but the, uh, when I first saw it, I thought, oh, it looks like it should be in science fiction. I thought, I probably did think it was science fiction until I actually saw it on the news and thought, oh, it's real, it's strange. Um, and the, the right portion of that image just shows you what it looks like when we've got a plasma running. So it looks a bit pink, purpley. Uh, the hottest bit is actually the bit that doesn't have any light emitting from it. The little white bits at the bottom are the hottest regions to a visible camera just because that's where all of the heat is being, uh, sorry, the light is being radiated away from those particular bits. <coughs> um, the hotter sections emit different radiation in a sort of an X-ray range instead, because it's much hotter. <coughs> uh, the, the walls are made up of different tiles, you can see as well. They're now beryllium and tungsten tiles. Um, the reason for that is that they used to be carbon fiber, Carbon fiber retains a lot of the tritium, unfortunately, which means that you're wasting fuel when you're just pumping in, in there. 
Um, so you don't get a very efficient reaction. It's also heavier carbon. So what would happen if, for instance, when plasma struck the side of the wall, either by accident or on purpose for certain experiments, you'd get bits of carbon flying into the plasma, and those carbon uh, nuclei would actually take away energy from the plasma and therefore reduce your confinement time, making it less efficient. So what you'd need to do is um, ideally reduce the amount of mass uh, that anything that did go into the plasma, the impurities, uh, has so that you can increase the confinement time or lose less of it, in other words. And because it's beryllium, it doesn't retain tritium, which is also useful. Uh, we operate another device at Cullum, um, which is the UK Fusion Program, which is a bit smaller. It's called the Mega Amp Spherical Tokamak, which is what MASS stands for. Um, and it is exactly that. It's spherical rather than a ring donut shape. Um, it's more like a cord apple rather than a ring donut, in effect. And these are potentially useful as second generation uh, power plants, or at least the technology in power plants, because they, they will run cheaper, because you can get a higher um, plasma pressure for the amount of magnetic, pressure, uh, magnetic field that you're using instead. So it would both be cheaper and more efficient in a way. Uh, one suggestion that someone else came up with, not us at Cullum, but uh, in a workshop in 2009, was that you could actually use these to remove all of the current nuclear waste on Earth. Um, because when you generate all those neutrons, if you surrounded one of these devices with a jacket of nuclear waste, fission waste, you would uh, then forcibly um, transmutate those elements, the nuclear waste, back into something that would be less radioactive and less hazardous. So in principle, you could get rid of all of our nuclear waste with these machines. But that's still some way off, and we don't have any involvement with that at the moment. Um, I don't know if we will or not in the future. Um, so that was what we have. Um, being built in the south of France at the moment is this next generation device, which is called ITER. It's a large international project rather than just a European project. There's seven partners to it. Um, and that's a, an image to scale. So you can see JET on the right, which is quite big, about 12 meters high. But ITER on the left is significantly larger. Uh, the the, the D-shaped torus itself is about two, um, two times the size in each dimension. So it will hold about eight times as much plasma. And that demonstrates basically what the jump is between the JET project and the ITER project. They're, it's just scaling, basically. The reason it's scaling is just so that we can get a better confinement time and hopefully prove uh, that we can get 10 times as much energy from the fusion reactions out as we put in heating energy instead of the uh, inefficiency of the jet machine at the moment. But jet was never designed to produce more power out than in. Uh, ITER will, hopefully. It'll produce about 500 megawatts for every megawatt of heating power. Uh, none of that will actually be put on the grid. Um, I don't know if there are any plans to at all in the very far future. But at the moment, it is just an engineering experiment. It's to prove that we can actually build one of these at a scale that would be useful for a power station. Uh, you'll also see there's a bit more to ITER than JET. Uh, it's surrounded by something called a cryostat, which is the large containment vessel. That's going to keep everything inside it under a vacuum. And the reason for that is that you want to keep everything quite cold. Um, the reason being the coils, instead of the copper coils that we have in JET at the moment, which can only run for about 60 seconds maximum, uh, will be superconductors in ITER, which means they have no electrical resistance. And you uh, can keep them running potentially indefinitely because they don't eat up. The thing is, you need to keep them at minus 269 degrees Celsius anyway. So by having a, a large containment vessel which surrounds the machine, you can keep it much colder uh, in a vacuum. Uh, there are various other systems like neutral beams heating and radio frequency heating that will probably be included on ITER as well in the same way that JET is. Uh, I don't know if uh, microwave heating is or not, though. So that's the ITER site at the moment. That was taken in uh, June this year. So it does show that there is actually progress happening in nuclear fusion, because the joke is fusion is always 30 years away and has been for the last 50 years. Um, but now it is actually being built, you can see. Um, so it's, qu it's quite a large site. That's about 60 football fields. The the ITER tokamak, so all of that on the left there, the base there, goes in that black central bit in the middle. So you, you kind of get a scale for how big the site is. It's huge. Um, 
but compared to an enormous solar field or a wind field, for instance, it would be fairly minimal for a power station. <clears throat> Obviously, this kind of project, because it's international, will cost uh, a fair bit of money. Uh, in total, it's estimated to be about 13 billion euros at the moment. Um, that's an estimate that's done in kind. So the seven different partners, which are um, the EU, US, Russia, India, China, Japan, and South Korea, um, are all giving bits of equi equipment to the ITER project rather than actually contributing money into a central pot. There's only about 10% of the budget is actually given as money. <coughs> so um, to put that in context, though, that, that's about 1.2 uh, billion euros per year because it's over about 11 years. Um, which, it is a lot of money, but when you compare it to other forms of research that we have, so for instance, wind research gets on the order of about 100 billion euros every single year. Um, fusion in total only gets about 2 billion euros. It's, it's a fairly uh, small proportion of research money and energy. We don't really tend to put that much research, uh, sorry, that much money from profit into energy research, unfortunately. Beyond that, uh, once it's built, which should be about 2020, 2022 maybe, um, it will operate, it will show that we can get enough power out than in, and then we need to build a demonstration power plant on a much larger scale to prove that it is actually commercially feasible to use fusion power to power our, uh, our lives, basically. Uh, so this is planned to be a two gigawatt power plant, and there's a European roadmap to try and get it putting energy on the grid by 2050. Um, and hopefully that will be the case. So I don't think I have much more on there other than basic summary. So that's what we're doing. We're trying to make micro stars on Earth um, because they are clean. They can provide a baseload power supply. That's the key part. The renewables being variable, they're dependent on location and um, possibly weather, uh, which is, is fine if you have enough storage cap capacity. But for when you need a continuous supply of energy, fusion will be very useful. And there is an abundant supply of fuel. Um, so you, you don't restrict people to where they are in any way, really, just because there is so much water available on Earth. And yes, there's comparatively little land required compared to other renewable sources. Obviously, renewable energy is good. We need more of it. We need more funding in general. Um, but after that, ITER, which is soon, and um, that will prove that it is technically possible to do this and engineer, in an engineering sense possible. And then, hopefully, after ITER, demo. Um, and at that point, we will hopefully start to work a lot more with uh, in, in the energy industry. And they would start to put forward potential refinements to the design to try and make it cheaper and commercially feasible for future, future fusion power stations. Um, thank you. Oops. There you go. Where's it going? Oh. Uh, are there any questions at all? Yep. Microphone. Hiya. Um, so as I understand it, you had a number of problems to overcome. To get ignition, yep. to get containment, and they seem to be more or less on the way to being sorted. The, yeah, sorry. And the problem of sustaining, is that the next problem to over overcome? And why would that take till 2040 to overcome? Well, the, the actual fusion reactions have been done. In 1997, JET produced 16 megawatts of fusion energy, but it, it had to put in 24 megawatts of energy to actually get to that stage. So we haven't actually achieved uh, a net energy out yet. Um, in about 2017, JET's planning to run um, another deuterium and tritium campaign. The past few years have just been deuterium only, um, and that produces less power. But it, it may be possible to get almost the same amount of energy out from the fusion reactions as heating power in. Um, but that it's unlikely that, well, I don't know. It, it might not be likely. I'm not a physicist, like I said. But we're, so. talking, <laughs> we're talking reactions of seconds now, are we? Or portions of a second? Uh, the, the actual reactions are very, very quick, yeah. And so um, the, the job is to 
get it sustaining for a second and two seconds and ten seconds and forever. Uh, and ever. If, yeah, there's a there's a point at which it's actually called ignition. Uh, if you put in, I think it's six times the amount of energy that you need for a, a net energy output, you get what's called ignition, where the confinement time is high enough so that the the alpha particle that's released from the neutron stays within the plasma and transfers enough of its energy to keep the reaction going without putting any more additional heating in, or very little additional heating, just to maintain it. Um, so at that point, that's what uh, ITER would be, hopefully, um, doing for us. Yep. I was going to ask uh, t two questions, really. First one being, um, I guess you're relying on the advance of supercapacitor technology. Uh, because I couldn't see one of these machines being run in my car to get me from A to B. <laughs> so I, I'm guessing you're relying on charging other devices from the grid from this energy source or in use with other green technologies? I, I don't know. Well, um, this would be more to do with actually just generating uh, a power replacement, if you like, for fossil fuels rather than anything else. So it would be our, our standard form of power rather than specifically to put energy into devices. But if it was all on the grid anyway, it wouldn't really make much difference where it's coming from. Um, with regard to capacitors, uh, we, we aren't aiming for that specifically. This is just to try and show that we can get energy out from this to put it onto the grid rather than actually hold the energy and store it, which is a slightly different research subject. But we, we don't um, do that. My, my other question was going to be to you, um, given the expense and the amount of uh, development that's gone into this, how do you see these machines being used in nat developing nations um, at the moment that maybe can't afford this but have a massive power uh, demand and will far exceed us pretty quickly? I, I can't predict the future. Um, I would quite like to see <laughs> uh, some kind of collaboration between lots of nations that would um, provide the blueprints maybe for a power station of this kind. Um, but I don't know, there's obviously political arguments to make for and against that kind of thing. So I, I honestly don't know is the answer. Okay, thank um, you. okay. thanks very much.